Hello, I'm Johnny Delgado and welcome to this slideshow on my literature review, Aesthetics in Post-Secondary CS Educational Games. So what are we here to talk about? There are a lot of studies on games to teach people at the post-secondary level computer science. Uh, the majority of the game-based intervention research in the post-secondary space is in STEM fields. And in just computer science alone, 68 digital games and 40 non-digital games were found in a literature review in 2016. So there's quite a bit of material to go on, but high volume does not necessarily mean high efficacy. So before we really get into it, there's a certain amount of prior knowledge uh, in game design that we need to talk about this at the research level. So types of games. What are the frameworks that we can use to talk about different types of games? Well, one of the oldest comes to us from Richard Bartle in 1996 in a paper called Hearts, Clubs, Diamonds, Spades. Players who suit muds. Now, I said a lot of things that probably mean absolutely nothing to you. Uh, muds are multi-user dungeons. Uh, Richard Bartle, the researcher, was actually one of the co-creators of the first mud, known as Mud 1. Uh, you know, very creative name for that. Uh, these are text-based multiplayer games, and if they call to mind uh, something like Zork, uh, you know, where it's just you see text, you read it, and you respond by typing, uh, good, because this is uh, it's sort of a, a very, uh, there's a very strong through line from those early text-based games to MUDs. And if you're looking at this and also thinking, oh, okay, fantasy multiple users, this reminds me of massive multiplayer online role-playing games or MMORPGs, you're also right. This is like a, these are sort of the forgotten middle ones uh, in, in the mix. So Richard Bartle was interested in why people enjoyed playing these games, uh, why people were engaging. And what he found was rather interesting because of all of the people he was studying who were playing the exact same game, he found four very distinct groups that were interacting with the games for totally different reasons. Uh, the, um, the groups he divided into were uh, uh, based on playing card suits, but today we refer to these as killers, achievers, explorers, and socializers, just because they're more representative of what they are. Uh, achievers like winning the game. They like playing the game for its generally directed purpose. Explorers like exploring the game world. These are the people that, you know, go off the beaten path and hunt for secrets in there. These are why game designers put Easter eggs in games. Uh, socializers are people that engage with games as a form of socialization, whether to just chat with someone or even make friends. Uh, because remember, we're talking about MUDs and, you know, the multi-user part of multi-user dungeon is there are other real human players uh, that are also you're able to communicate with. And finally, killers. We have, uh, we have multiple people in a situation where you're, uh, you know, going through a dungeon. Players can fight and attack other players. This is what uh, nowadays is commonly called PVP or player versus player. Uh, these types of players just enjoy that. It's that uh, it's that competitive kind of nature that you might see in in uh, you know competitive sports. So different people were playing the exact same game for very different reasons, and that's what I want you to keep in mind because we're going to look at another framework that was uh, that comes from a paper in 2015 called Game Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics, or I might refer to them as the Aesthetics of Play. So the MDA framework uh, talks about these terms that you might not be familiar with and some that you might be. Mechanics are just the actions that the player can take. In the original Mario Brothers, your primary actions are running and jumping. If you think about the original Mario game, most of what you spent your time doing was running and jumping. Uh, that, that's okay. That, even though that sounds oversimplified, it's okay to enjoy a game about running and jumping. Dynamics are the in-game systems that the players engage in. Uh, you see these a lot in, in RPGs, like a, a crafting magic item system or, or solving puzzles in a, in a role-playing game. 
these are these are the dynamics of the game. They're they're kind of like the the why to the mechanic. And finally, we get to aesthetics. This is how players interact with the game. This is the kind of fun they're having. And mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics defined eight different aesthetics. Uh, these were sensation, game as sense pleasure. This, what does that mean? This is a uh, sensory stimulus that's enjoyable. This could be a game that you absolutely love the art for. That that you or you you say you know hey I'm just going to play this game because I love the soundtrack and you know I you know, playing the game's fine and all but oh that music fantastic. Uh, this is sensation. Anything where you are enjoying some sensory element of the game. And that's one of the reasons why you play. Fantasy is game as make-believe. Do not confuse fantasy, the genre, like castles and dragons and knights and all that stuff, with fantasy, the aesthetic. Fantasy as an aesthetic is just game as make-believe. Uh, my favorite example to use with my old students was the game Rock Band. The fantasy of the game Rock Band is feeling like a rock star. Uh, that has nothing to do with, you know, medieval fantasy, but it is still a fantasy to live out. Game as narrative is is uh, is drama. It's it's playing a game for the same reason you might read a book or watch a soap opera. There's a story in the game, and you are playing that game to get at that story. Challenge is defined as game as obstacle course. This is, there is a difficult thing you're, the game presents you with, and in, in, and you have to solve it. You have to defeat it. Next, uh, game, uh, next is fellowship. Game as social framework. This is like Bartle's socializers. Challenge, if you might have caught it, is like Bartle's achievers. Um, th this is, you are playing the game to, to make friends or interact with other people. Uh, Next is Discovery, which like almost directly maps onto Bartle's Explorer player type, if not directly. Uh, this is game as uncharted territory. Uh, it, it, that is exploring the world. That is part of that is the fun you are getting. Uh, expression is a bit odd to talk about. Uh, it's a game as self-discovery. It's it's basically using the game as as art, not as art to appreciate. That would be sensation but art as uh, uh, a, a way of self-expression. This is, you know, if you see anyone in Minecraft making beautiful, large-scale architecture, and you're like, wow, that, is, that must have taken a lot of time and creativity and effort, that is expression. Um, uh, Mario Paint is, is also expression. This is game as, as like way to create art. You can think of it that way. And finally, submission, a bit of an odd term for this. This is game as pastime. This is that turn your brain off kind of feeling. I just had a long day at work. I want to relax with some candy crush on my phone. That's submission. It's usually low effort, relaxing, just it's a thing you do. And, uh, you know, who doesn't like to relax sometimes? One thing I'll note, some people have referred to it as a ninth aesthetic. It sort of fits in between challenge and fellowship. Uh, competition. This is specifically challenge against other people. It's the distinction that Bartle made between achievers and killers. Uh, uh, there is a different kind of fun to be had. Not according to this framework, but many people argue that there is a different kind of fun from uh, being challenged by other human players versus being challenged by the game. And, and I'm inclined to agree. Uh, so combining those two, we can get, we can get nine different uh, aesthetics, although technically here there are eight aesthetics according to the literature. So another distinction to make, from here on out, when I say aesthetics, I'm going to refer to the core or primary aesthetics as opposed to just any of them that are present. Uh, you could, you could really enjoy the way a game looks, but that might not be why most people come to it to play. Uh, that's, that's different. Uh, a, a competitive shooter like Overwatch, for example, you might really enjoy the graphics and the look of the game, but if you're really coming to that for the working together with a team, fellowship, or defeating enemies, uh, uh, competition or challenge, um, 
then sensation isn't really a core aesthetic, if that makes sense. Uh, although there, there are a lot of games that you could say, oh, they appeal to most of these in some capacity for some players. And that's true, but we're really going to be focusing on on the core of why people play these games when we analyze the games. So, uh, as a summary, Bartle was looking at types of players and the aesthetics were looking at ways players engage. These are just two sides of the same coin. Uh, different types of people will engage in specific games for different reasons. Different people are different. So, what's the goal of this literature review? We're trying to analyze the types of games that are used to teach computer science in post-secondary education. Uh, we're excluding all studies that are not looking at game-based interventions, which makes sense. Uh, we're ignoring studies that aren't specifically looking at computer science education, so any other STEM field or any other field in general, not going to look at. Uh, any studies related to K through 12 education, oh, I see the typo in there, it should be studies related to K through 12 education, we're ignoring. And studies that weren't using specific games, like if uh, they're perhaps referring to too many or they're not describing their game-based intervention, uh, you know, we just couldn't analyze what those core aesthetics are. So to get the papers, the, uh, uh, I used the, the Primo search in UF's digital library. Uh, these were my search terms, if you care to look at them. Uh, and some initial observations just to orient us before getting into the meat of it. Certain aesthetics are used far more frequently than others. Uh, challenge was incredibly common, overwhelmingly the most common. There were maybe one or two games I was able to analyze that was not a challenge game. Uh, competition and fantasy. You'll note that I've separated out competition. Uh, you know, I, I think the mix of, uh, of Bartle's uh, taxonomy and the aesthetics are, are a good enough justification for separating competition from challenge. Uh, so competition and fantasy are somewhat common, fairly frequently used, uh, and all the rest were incredibly rare, if not just not present entirely. So first up, challenge, game as obstacle course. Um, as I said, it's the most common by far, and I believe this is because typical classroom education is sort of based around challenge. You can easily see how a teacher, you know, asking a question or giving a pop quiz might map to a challenge in a game. There is this thing you have to accomplish, answering this question the teacher calls on you to ask, or doing well on this pop quiz, that can map very well to a challenge game. Uh, you can look at scores in a video game as the analog to grades in a classroom. Both measure performance. And uh, a, a semester's instruction is usually broken down into units. And you know, oh, at the end of that unit, you'll take a test. Similarly, you might be thinking, a lot of games are divided into levels, and at the end of that level, there's a final boss. This, is, this level based gameplay is a hallmark of, of a lot of challenge games. So it's, it's very easy conceptually to map classroom instruction onto challenge games. And I just want to bring up a parallel between Bartle's achiever player type to, to challenge. Uh, I know I did before, but I think it bears repeating. So what are the benefits of challenge? Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, many, many studies talked about how it increases motivation and engagement. And if we look at a lot of the studies, and you know, I can cite things all the way back to 1908 with the Yerkes Dodson Law, challenge improves performance. If you increase stress, if you give someone a difficult task to complete, it, it increases engagement. If you do it too much, you get over to the, the right side of that bell curve and you can get anxiety. They're just it's too much pressure, too much challenge, and that decreases performance. Or if you don't provide enough challenge, it can cause a you know loss of engagement. You know the students at the top of the class getting bored when you are over explaining whatever it is you're talking about. Kind of like how I might be over explaining this right now. Uh, this leads us very nicely into drawbacks. Too much or too little pressure, too much or too little challenge, and you lose engagement. 
uh, which could decrease performance in the game or in learning. Uh, it's easy for teachers to gauge this in the classroom because you can kind of see students nodding off or, or when they're just completely lost because you've gone too fast and you can speed up or slow down your instruction as needed. But we're not at the point where we can easily create games that adapt to the level of challenge people need. Um, some games uh, find a way to do this by adjusting their challenge based on performance. You know, if, uh, if players aren't doing well, decrease the challenge, make it easier for them. Or if they're doing way too well, ramp up the challenge, give them more enemies, give them more difficult problems. Uh, however, in, this, in the studies looked at for this literature review, I did, I did not find any, uh, any studies that were using game-based interventions that were that advanced, dynamically adjusting their level of challenge based on the player's uh, abilities. Or if I did, it was not described in the papers. Um, most studies don't check more than the percentage of students who feel engaged, so we may be seeing issues where, oh, your challenge based your challenge game based intervention is engaging sixty or seventy percent of the students, but you know, forty or thirty percent of them are absolutely not enjoying this and they're just tuning out. Uh, that we might completely ignore. Um, there, there was not uh, a lot of, you know, baseline of, is this possibly detrimental to the students? It was just, overall, people found it engaging, so great. Um, and the vast majority of the game-based interventions used challenge. Uh, and to remind you, there are, there are eight aesthetics according to the, uh, the Mechanics Dynamics Aesthetics Framework um, or, or nine as, as we're defining it here if we include competition as different than challenge. Uh, so it seems odd that you, would on, that you would see the vast majority of them being only one of these aesthetics. So next we're going to move on to competition. Uh, it's not as prevalent as challenge, but it's still widely used in these studies. Um, it's nice because it allows for uh, a measure of progress and can also increase motivation just like challenge. Um, it appeals to Bartle's killers. Uh, it's, it's hard to achieve, you know, to implement multiplayer games in video game based interventions. It's just, you know, more difficult to program multiplayer games than single player games. However, if you think back to that, uh, that 2016 literature review, a lot of games to teach computer science were board games in the studies. And it's very easy to have multiplayer board games. Um, however, something to note is while you do get competition in a, in a board game with multiple players, you also add in the inherent benefit of group work, which is absolutely amazing for teaching. But when it comes to us analyzing the results and saying, oh yes, this was effective because it was a game-based intervention that used competition, well, well, slow down there because it could have just been the inherent effects of group work improving student performance. That's why we saw benefits there. So, you know, uh, forgive me, but a lot of my, my, uh, my speech here might be to temper your expectations. Um, but now let's talk about video games. Uh, it, just because it's hard to program multiplayer games does not mean we are completely lost when it comes to easy ways of adding player versus player competition to our game-based interventions. Leaderboards or scoreboards can be implemented to just allow students to compare themselves to their peers, uh, which just needs to exist in the form of displaying a student's score publicly. Uh, this doesn't even need to be built into the game. This could be a situation where a game-based intervention has a score and the teacher gets that score and then just posts the, uh, the scores publicly on the learning management software. Um, it can provide a lot of beneficial peer pressure, just competition in general, to encourage students to try to improve their own scores when they see metrics of like, oh, that student's doing better. Maybe I should try extra hard. Uh, there were a lot of situations where students were turning in assignments earlier or doing or you know going above and beyond because the the game implemented competition however there could also be detrimental effects in students comparing themselves to each other uh, in an unhealthy way 
Uh, Liang et al. attempted to mitigate this problem by only showing the top 15 students in the leaderboard uh, to, quote, avoid embarrassing the weaker students at the bottom. And, uh, and this helps mitigate that, but you might still have students feel like, oh, I didn't make the leaderboard. That, that stinks for me. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Competition may not engage everyone and can be detrimental. Next, fantasy. Not as ubiquitous as challenge, but you know, then again, no other aesthetic is, uh, but still relatively common. And I think that's because it's a very low effort way to increase motivation. If, if someone really engages with a particular fantasy, um, you know, how hard is it to flavor the game as like, oh, you're learning CS, but there's also a dragon and, and you know, sword fighting. Great, cool. If you like that type of fantasy, it, it may make the game more engaging. However, not to, you know, once again be the Debbie Downer, but there's a high potential for players to disengage with specific fantasies. Um, I'm going to cite uh, Saving Sarah by Barnes et al., uh, which is a game-based CS intervention uh, centered around uh, saving a kidnapped princess. And I believe this could draw out negative feelings about the classic damsel in distress trope. Uh, even though they do specify that, quote, Sarah is far from helpless. So it may be the case that in the game, it is not this uh, stereotypical helpless damsel in distress. But the mere presence of um, stereotypical elements of that, of that trope could create a, a negative association with the stereotype in players. And these negative feelings could cause certain players or students to disengage. And it's easy for researchers to not see this effect, uh, such as in the case of Saving Sarah, most of the participants were white males between ages 18 to 24. If, in a hypothetical situation, female participants are uninterested when they see what the game-based intervention is and self-select out of doing the study, uh, it's it's hard to see if it w if it's as engaging as it is. If, for example, it was more engaging towards men than women, uh, or if you know just by virtue of this particular CS class might have been more men than women in it, uh, the data wouldn't reflect lower engagement with uh, with women in there. So. Saying that these studies are effective does not tell the whole story, and it's important to keep that in mind. Um, next, let's talk about the rarely used aesthetics. Lack of representation of all eight aesthetics, uh, or, or, or nine if we're adding in uh, uh, competition. Uh, but So first, let's talk about fellowship, which was seen in certain places. Um, as we mentioned, it's far easier to implement multiplayer engagement in board games rather than video games. Uh, so it makes sense that we see a little bit of fellowship in these studies just because it's, it's very closely tied to, um, uh, to competition. Uh, but why don't we see the other aesthetics? Or why do we so rarely see the aesthetics other than the three that we've already talked about? Well. It could be because that the ones we've already mentioned are uh, are frequently used, and then other researchers see this and say, "Oh well, you know, competition's effective for all these reasons. I'm going to do a competition-based intervention." Um, it could be that uh, that it's just easier to program uh, competition, challenge, and fantasy games, um, and and it's you know maybe inherently harder to give some some narrative. Uh, underlying background to teaching recursion than it is to just you know make a challenge game for it um, but regardless of why um, the big three are seen as tried and true ways of doing you know game based post secondary CS educational instruction um, so our research question here is what aesthetics are shown to be most effective to implement in game-based interventions used to teach CS in post-secondary education? And what we find is overwhelmingly the recommendation seems to be challenge. The vast majority of these games use challenge, and to a lesser degree, 
competition and fantasy. Uh, I do want to note some things. All studies that were analyzed were shown to be effective. And this, the, the lack of representation of all the aesthetics and the fact that they were all shown to be effective based on how the researchers defined effective uh, prevents us from being able to say that these three aesthetics are more effective than the others. So, you know, m my favorite part here, issues with the whole conclusion. Um, many of these studies lacked rigor. There was another study that actively called this out in, in what was the equivalent of a scientific oh snap moment. Um, many studies defined efficacy as students self-reporting that they were more engaged or just engaged with the game, which isn't, it's, it's not really something that we can say is more effective than if they had, you know, just had traditional instruction. Um, there was a lack of quantifiable improvement being studied. Uh, you know, we didn't see a lot of test scores or fulfilled learning objectives being quantified and analyzed to say, oh, the group with the game was more effective than the group without. Um, there was some, but the vast majority lacked this degree of rigor. Um, there are many ways to engage in games. Uh, this is just my, my, final, my final plea. Uh, it's, it's very unlikely that using only three out of the eight or nine aesthetics will engage all players. Two of Bartle's quadrants were entirely ignored here, uh, discovery and, and fellowship, the, uh, the explorers and the socializers. Um, it, it seems like a, a significant oversight to just not have all of the aesthetics represented in, in the research. Uh, there are many different kinds of games. The games industry knows this, the, you know, the academic game researching space knows this, yet for some reason we see a very small percentage of types of games or types of forms of engagement uh, shown in these game-based educational in, uh, 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 interventions, at least for the post-secondary CS space. So, you know, final, final conclusions. There, there are definitely gaps in the literature um, you know, making the, making the way we define efficacy more rigorous, I think would help a lot, but also, uh, looking into more types of games, uh, to, to try to engage more groups or even finding ways to look at, you know, we might be engaging certain people in our study more, but we may be causing others to disengage. And, and, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't seem like the, the uh, glorious glowing review of all of these studies claim to be effective that, uh, that just that statement might have you believe. So I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for sticking around to watch the whole video. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I've been Johnny Delgado. Have a wonderful day.